Okay, well, it's 6.01 by my clock, and we're gonna go ahead and get started. I know that Commissioner Regalado is planning on joining us as well. So we'll uh, I'll go ahead and get started. And then certainly if she pops in later, we'll uh, allow, allow her to say a few words. And so, as I said, uh, let me just get started here. Good. So good evening. My name is Ray Baker, director of the Miami-Dade Public Library System. And thank you all for joining us tonight for this community input meeting to discuss, to discuss the conceptual renderings for the future Key Biscayne Library branch. And before we begin, I'll take over a few housekeeping items. Uh, so we are in what's called webinar mode in Zoom. That means all of you who are attendees to the meeting uh, are gonna be in really listen only mode um, for the first part of the meeting. Um, so you won't see your cameras on right now, but you'll, you will see your names on the uh, chat screen. <clears throat> so, and after we finish the presentation, you know, which we think will take, you know, around 30 to 40 minutes, uh, we will open it up for questions. And while we were going through the presentation, there are ways that you can interact while we're doing the presentation. Uh, there is a chat feature, which if you look on your control panel, panel for Zoom, it says chat. And there's also a Q&A, and you can use either one and submit questions as we go through the presentation. Uh, we'll try to address them as they come up. Uh, but just so you know, there's a lot going on on my screen right now. So it may very well be after the presentation that I'm able to catch up with all of them. Um, and I believe there's also maybe a raise your hand function as well that you can um, raise your hand as a participant um, you know, once we're in the discussion mode and question and answer mode later, raise your hand if you wanna ask a question. So, and I would just ask you, you know, to try to limit the chat to um, just questions. Uh, it gets filled up very quickly and wanna make sure that we are able to answer any input that we receive. So as we get started, uh, we do have a panel and you can see all of our panelists that are up here. Um, and I already introduced myself. So I'm one of the panelists and we also have our architectural team with us tonight from Ferguson, Glasgow, Schuster, Soto, Inc. We have Natividad Soto, who is the president. We have Emilio Bustillo. And I think we will have Morgan Grabowski join us in a few minutes as well. And also joining us tonight is our village, your own village manager, um, Mr. Steve Williamson, who is on the call in case any questions come up that might end up going his way. And we appreciate you being here. Thanks, Ray. And we have a couple of members of my team, Ms. Lydia Lopez, Ralph Costa, and our construction manager, Lisa Thompson. And I know also signed up on the call, we have a few other of my colleagues, both from other county departments and a couple of other library folks as well. And I was hoping that would be like the perfect cue for Commissioner Regalado, but I haven't seen her pop on yet. Excuse me, Ray, I'm Commissioner Regalado as an attendee. If we just need to move her from attendee to panelist. So. Okay, can I do that? Yes, you have that power. Oh boy. <laughs> Promote the panelists. You've been promoted, Commissioner. There we go. All right. And also joining us, our very own County Commissioner from District 7, Raquel Regalado. Wonderful timing. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's a joy to be with you guys. Thank you all for taking the time. We're really excited. Ray and his team has done such a wonderful job uh, and we've been working on this for a long time. So we're excited about tonight and we hope you like everything that you see. Thank you, Commissioner. <clears throat> So before we get going, you know, I, I do want to make sure that everyone understands that the conceptual design renderings we have are just that conceptual. Um, you know, I do hear comments sometimes as in, you know, the renderings aren't showing any landscaping and things like that. Um, understand that what we're showing you now are not every detail of the site that will eventually be incorporated into it. 
So we want you to understand that, you know, as it relates to landscaping and the types of finishes and colors and all that, you know, that has not been decided yet. And everything we have here is really to give you a good understanding of what the building looks like, what the spaces inside look like, as well as a good understanding of the adjacencies to the building. Um, so I just want to put that out there in case people have comments about landscaping. And certainly we, we want to hear concepts about or comments about the type of landscaping you know, you're interested in. Um, but understand that those details, you will not see the full extent of them yet because they just haven't been decided upon. And with that, um, I'm going to tag team on this presentation, largely with our architectural team. Um, but I'm going to jump into the first slide. And before I do that, let me just take a quick look at the chat feature. Okay, looks like we're okay so far. So just to give you the current status, I know there's a lot of people on this call who have been very in involved and up to date on where we are so far, but also this uh, may be the first opportunity for some residents who really haven't understood what's going on and what we're doing. And this is a continuation of you know, what we're calling the community input phase on the con conceptual design renderings. Um, you know, we started working with Ferguson Glasgow in about roughly October 2020. Um, so it's been you know, a little over you know, a year and two or three months. And we are working with them on the visioning of the building. We are working with them on you know, different, different concepts for what this building would look like. And then in around May and June of 2021, uh, we did a presentation to the village council. Uh, we had several meetings with our neighbors at Key Colony, and we've continued to you know, take feedback on this design and work through it with Ferguson Glasgow, bringing us to you know, where we are today. And I wanted to mention that you know, if you you want to take more time to look at the presentation and the slides, you know, we do have this feedback at mdpls.org email address set up. Um, I received a handful of comments and questions throughout the week since we set up that, that site. And I personally am responding to all of them. So you will get a response and we do want you, if you wanna be more contemplative in your response, please do share. You know, I'll respond and we'll also share that feedback with our architectural team. Um, so eventually when we get past, you know, the conceptual design, our public input, and really start to land on what the final building will look like, um, we hope our next step will be to get to the design criteria stage. Um, we will also be using Ferguson Glasgow for the design criteria stage of this project. Um, and that would probably take roughly four to five months, you know, from the estimates that we bounced around. And from there, we would go to a stage to, you know, develop the request for proposals to advertise and eventually select a design build team that would build the library. And the next slide, we start to get into the renderings. And I've asked Ferguson Glasgow if they could take over a, a few of these slides and I'll, I'll be glad to forward it for you to talk about a little bit about the building, you know, where we started and where we are now. And I'll, do I need to unmute? Am I unmuting you, Natty, or, or Emilio? Okay. I got it. Yeah. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Emilio Bustillo. I'm uh, one of the design architects from Ferguson Glasgow Schuster Soto. Um, and just Kind of to give you a, a quick overview of uh, of the of the building uh, concept here. One second. Okay, so the the design approach uh, began with ways uh, to to create thinking of ways to create a more multidisciplinary space for all ages that would function as a hub for recreation, information, exploration, collaboration, and creativity. We set out to design a signature building with a with a civic presence, 
one that addresses the local climate response to the site's unique location, uh, while also addressing security maintenance uh, resi and resiliency concerns. Uh, the civic building design would provide Key Biscayne re uh, residents with much needed public gathering spaces and a place to uh, reinforce community identity and culture. Uh, the conceptual design proposed attempts to merge the ideas of architecture and landscape and uh, to emphasize the connection to nature and the surrounding outdoors, uh, since architecture and landscape design should grow from local climate, topography, and building practice. The conceptual design attempts to create a perceptually seamless connection between the lush landscaping existing on the site, uh, the building, and the building programs that, are, that will be serving the community. As Ray mentioned, the vegetation depicted in the renderings is not reflective of what is currently on site, nor what the final design intent is. Uh, the final uh, design, it, it plans to have significantly more landscape uh, integration into the nooks, uh, crevices, and setbacks in the building perimeter uh, to create this idea of the building rising out of the, the plan landscape. Uh, so we, uh, as I mentioned, I put uh, we put landscape first as uh, since this building it's an in a unique existing condition, and we would uh, love to maintain the wooded uh, room feeling uh, of the existing site. Um, we're also attempting to remain uh, respectful to the adjacent neighbors by limiting any uh, or uh, limiting the openings onto private and public areas of uh, of neighbors like Key Colony, Emerald Bay. And uh, we've also uh, shifted the service uh, drive away from the existing parking lot to the more public uh, Sanesta drive on the south side uh, and placing it in a more public setting and uh, with the hopes of reducing any operational noise uh, emanating from the, from the library. Uh, so we're also attempting to shift the program and the, the, the new building as southward as possible to maintain the beautiful pond and existing landscaping on site. Um, another goal was to have the building peek through the main uh, to through the landscape onto the main street to provide a civic face to the library, uh, while also uh, attempting to remain uh, immersed uh, and maintaining uh, immersed in, in in that landscape, as I mentioned, and maintaining that great uh, walk. That exists on the on the east side of the of the site when you're walking, let's say from from the existing parking lot onto the library, the the back entrance of the existing library. That that it's it's a beautiful existing condition. So we're trying to provide a more purposeful and impact entrance to the building, uh, and clarifying the main entrance points from the par uh, the parking lot and from Crandon Boulevard. Uh, the parking and vehicular entrance will remain in the existing location and the parking lot will be reconfigured uh, to the larger square footage. And uh, we have also planned to add a dedicated golf cart parking. I know uh, Ray is going to go over the, 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 the program. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that to a little later when we're showing the, the floor plans. Um, the structure of the building is the architecture. It embraces its skeletal form. Uh, to reveal the, the true reading of how the building works. Uh, the building is designed with a uh, floor to ceiling glass with shaded with land, uh, large overhangs, which create a clear line of sight throughout the building to address security and ease of navigation. Uh, it provides an immediate and unencumbered visual connection to the exterior landscape and outdoor activities. And the material configurations and the use of glass also creates a lightweight looking building that blends in with the surrounding landscape. And then we have this twisting facade screen, which is a it, it's a stylized interpretation of a mangrove root system uh, and it emphasizing both its, its verticality and the twisting nature of one of South Florida's uh, beloved plants, uh, while also recall, uh, recalling the, the movement of flipping through the pages of a book. Uh, the screen placement remains vertical at areas where additional shavy, uh, shading would be beneficial while twisting onto a horizontal orientation, uh, demarcating entrance points, uh, also where the building steps back away from the volume in the northwest corner facing Crandon Boulevard and where other modes of uh, shading are present. Um, I mean, Amelia, uh, 
Yep. Billy, do you want me to run through some of the move some of these slides for you? Sure. As you go yeah. yeah. Okay. And perhaps you can talk through them a little bit. Sure. Uh, what we're seeing here is the, the view with some of the existing landscape and without it. So you could see uh, more of the building on top is some of the existing landscape from across the street of Crandon Boulevard. And uh, without it, some shade, uh, some trees in the median and some uh, without it. Uh, there you on the bottom, you begin to see that that twisting screen freight facing Crandon Boulevard. Go on to the next slide. And, and just so you know, someone had asked me about the pond and the pond would stay exactly where it was. And there was also a question about, I guess the parking lot would be in the same location and the square footage of the building is going to be 20,000 square feet. We'll touch more on that later. There's one, I have a couple of things popping up in here that I'm trying to address. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, this is uh, the view from uh, Sine the, the corner of Sonesta Drive and, and Crandon Boulevard. And you, uh, this is a, a good uh, view of that twisting screen on, onto the, the top left-hand side. You see how it's vertical covering that Northwest uh, volume of the building with the uh, Miami Public Library signage on top. And then it begins to twist onto a, a horizontal uh, orientation along the, the west facade and shading the second level outdoor space. And then on the south facade, it turns down shading that whole south facade from top to bottom. Okay, here you begin to see uh, the relationship between the building and the pond. Um, the pond is, raise hand is more or less uh, you, you see it there in the background and on toward a, a little more toward the left on the on the property line you you see the remaining uh or the existing walk uh from the parking lot onto the the new entrance of the building which uh this view shows nicely so you see the pond on the right and then the the, the new entrance from the parking lot onto the two-story conceptual library so it's a a two-story uh, concept and what we're seeing here is uh the from the second level looking down and we're also able to see outdoor reading spaces with that uh with that uh, twisting screen shading screen on the on the Crandon Boulevard facade well, with the main reading room on the ground level uh some community rooms on the far both on the first and second level and a computer bar along this uh opening looking down onto the main reading room yeah, and just if you don't mind me mentioning, um, one of the changes we made from initial conceptual plans on this from back in May and June, we opened up this opening from that allows you to look down into the first floor. Previously, this was just two floors that had no connectivity between them other than stairwells and an elevator. So we really wanted to tie these two floors together and give it a little bit more interconnectivity. Here you begin uh, seeing uh, one of the, well, the, the second uh, floor outdoor reading space fa uh, facing Crandon Boulevard and it turns the corner onto Sonesta Drive. And in the back is, uh, you see the, the tutoring room for kids on the second level with the screen uh, providing some shading above. Yeah, and this was another change uh, in the original renderings from May, June. We had a front porch concept that really had more of an outdoor seating area facing Crandon Boulevard on the first floor. Uh, we decided that that might work out better on the second floor, and that's another change from the original renderings. This is a, a, a view from one of the community rooms looking and with uh, some glass on both ends of the elevator tower to the left you have the entrance to the the library from the parking lot 
And on the right, you could see the entrance from Crandon Boulevard and the, the main reading room beyond. All right, um, just a quick break, Emilio, um, just to remind everyone, and I see some questions coming in both in chat and the webinar, we will get caught back up with you. So, um, or if you have your hand raised, please you know, be patient and we will definitely open this up for questions as we get through the presentation. I'll try to respond to as many as I can um, in writing while Emilio is talking, but can't promise you'll be able to get to all of them until we're done with the PowerPoint. So thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, this is the view on the northeast corner overlooking the pond. So you, you begin to see the, the pond there on your between that, that left column and the glass, you begin to see the, the pond beyond and all the, the landscaping. And right below this is the main entrance uh, from the parking lot. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, this twisting uh, screen kind of marks at certain points once it, it turns horizontal. And one of, of those points is this entrance uh, from the parking lot. Because one of the things that we wanted to address is uh, we felt as the, the, the current, while, while we wanted to keep the, the walk from the existing parking lot onto the, to the library, because it's a, it's a great, great walk, we felt that it, the, the entrance to the existing library was not clear or, or nicely marked. So uh, this is one, one of the things that we wanted to tackle in this, uh, in this proposal just kind of provide a, a, a bit of a feature to mark both entrances on the Crandon Boulevard side and on the on the pond side. And here uh, you begin to see the view from the adjacent property from uh, from the Key Colony uh, Emerald Bay view. This is uh, the drive, the existing drive. And I believe more or less we modeled, we attempted to model the entrance to the, to the parking garage here. here. Uh, this is the drive and the entrance to the parking garage. Uh, the dividing, the existing dividing fence is uh, around where Ray's hand was, more or less. Yep, down a little. Yeah, there you go. And then you begin to see that the the existing, uh, the the proposed library beyond in white, and and the 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 very high windows that we're proposing. Uh, so obviously the, these Claire Story windows are high on purpose, just to allow some light natural light into the building into those spaces but to not have any of the library patrons directly looking over uh so we're trying to provide some some degree of privacy onto our our neighbors there and you begin to see that the the natural landscaping screen that exists between the 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 condo building and the the proposed library and as ray mentioned these renderings do not do justice to the amount of landscaping that's between these two properties and uh existing or what will be proposed so there will there is considerably more landscaping and more of a, a green buffer between both sides and emilio if i can just add you know for those of you who have been involved from the beginning you remember their discussion about these windows I don't believe they were in the original renderings, but you know, we had some discussions about them and they are a change from the last version of the renderings. And that's just another shot of the windows that were added in that side. You know, some of the comments we had received because there were no windows on that side originally was that it you know, looked like a retail center, you know, different comments like that. Um, so we put these windows high in mind for privacy concerns for the neighboring condos. Um, love to add some more windows there, but we can certainly talk about that further as we go through this process. Anything else you want to add in that slide, Emilio? No, no, that's just a, like, like you mentioned, another view onto the, the backside and okay. those high windows. And it probably won't be too easy to go through the kind of schematic floor plan layout, but uh, since the last version, uh, we've been doing a lot of work on the interior layout in terms of, you know, where do we want the children's room? Where do we want the bathrooms? And we did some initial 
layouts using the you know, shelving and where will the computers be. So I don't know how valuable uh, this is now because I'm going to do a little bit more discussion about the inside of the library in a few minutes. Um, but for those of you who are looking at the slide deck, this is like a very rough idea of the different rooms and the spaces and the way we might be able to accommodate the furniture and fixtures. Anything you want to add to that, Emilio? Sure. I mean, uh, just briefly, but you guys uh, hear something that 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 is clearly visible. It's the both entrances here on on the main axis from Crandon Boulevard, um, and you begin to see how how the building ends up tying into the the entrance from from the left side, from the north side, uh, facing the pond, and uh, beyond there you you begin to see more or less the, the perimeter of the pond and the operational, the, the, the access drive on Sonesta Drive here on, on the right-hand side. Hey, Emilio, one of our listeners asked if we had any renderings towards Sonesta Drive. Um, I don't know if I have the Sonesta view in this slide deck, but certainly it's something that we can you know, provide later. But uh, so thank you for that question. And this is the second floor floor plan layout that we've been working on. Um, up here is you know, where we have some of our really community event spaces and tutoring room, um, the community room lounge. Um, I think we had the U Media Center up here, which I'll talk about a little bit more. But this whole upper deck second floor is you know, largely enclosed except for this outdoor breezeway, which would be a sitting area. And this little outdoor reading, reading porch that we have shown here, this is the one that faces the pond on, from the second floor. So this is gonna be a very active area. It's gonna allow us a lot of flexibility for different types of programs and activities. And we'll be able to use it, you know, for people of all ages, really, for adult learning classes, for our U Media Center, for the tutoring. And I'll talk more about that as we get into the programmatic slides. So Amelia, you wanna talk about the elevations? No, I just wanted to mention something since I saw one, one quick comment. Uh, I believe uh, Ceci Sanchez had mentioned if, if the, the, the terrace could be shifted toward the pond instead of uh, Crandon Boulevard. And if, if you go back to one slide, Ray, you could see how we are already providing. I mean, it, it's a, a smaller terrace, but uh, there is a, a, an outdoor terrace uh, facing the pond and that uh, up, 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 up to the left on, on the top left of the building there. Also, also to that point, you know, when we met with Key Colony and we were, were dealing with the site, we didn't want to activate that area too much because it's directly adjacent, right, to their building. Correct. But I mean, we also don't want to completely negate one of the most beautiful portions of the of the building, no, of, of no. the site, right? So, I mean, we have, we did it uh, before we did have some considerable uh, frontage onto that pond and uh, it, it was reduced a bit by the enclosed uh, rooms uh, on the second level and and just as, as Raquel mentioned as the Commissioner Regalado mentioned it, it was uh, in response to some of the comments that we did receive yes thank you anytime but I will say that you know it might not be un, might not be undoable to wrap that outdoor terrace a little bit more around the corner of the pond Maybe that meeting room becomes a little smaller. It's something that we can look at. It's an interesting suggestion. All right, Emilio, you wanna talk about the elevations? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, uh, as you can see, I, I had mentioned some of that in my, in my little speech before. Uh, the structure is, is shown, right? It's kind of exposed uh, throughout. Um, and you begin to see that that twisting screen on the west elevation, uh, providing shade to the to the glass that's closest to the street. And then in areas where the building steps back more uh, towards the right, where where the pointer is currently, 
uh, it begins to turn up and shade the second floor. At this level, we already have that uh, the second level is providing some shade to the space below because the, the, the area below also steps back. And then on the on the north elevation, you see you're able to see that the twisting motion on the on the on the right hand side of the screen as it turns up. Uh, and this would be also uh, the area where the entrance from the, the parking lot is. Um, I think the renderings do a, a, a little better job of conveying all these items, but just kind of giving you a, an overview of the elevations. Hey, Emilio and Natty, you know, I know one question that is, I believe, going to come up on this side is the you know, western face and the issue of heat and the sunlight coming into the building from this side. Did you all talk about that a little bit? And I know we talked a little bit about this you know, internally, but let's go ahead and address it now. Sure, uh, not only is there the screen, the screen provides significant shade there, uh, especially on the west side, it's a vertical, you know, the vertical screens, but also the glass will be specified uh, you know, the high performance glasses that's available now is really fabulous at, at cutting uh, heat gain and even the feeling of radiant exposure uh, in those interior spaces. Obviously, the, the, some of the areas and the terraces will, will get the sun and some people really enjoy that, but there is a, a selection of areas here where you can sit on, on the terrace that will always be shaded. Uh, or pre be predominantly shaded. Uh, so there is a choice there. There are people that like the sun, so they can go there, and there are people that can go in the shade. But but again, there's there's some great glass selections available nowadays that really remediate that with uh, with very good uh, visibility results. Good, thank you. And you know, on the height of the building, I know this was a big topic of discussion. You know, back in the May June timeframe, uh, you know, we are at two stories. You know, this building will not go above two stories. Um, there will be not be any activity center on this on the rooftop or anything like that. Um, this is uh, at forty feet, and it will not be going any higher. So I just want to make sure we put that out there. Um, let me see. So let's just talk general features of the branch and tell you what, let me just take a quick break and see if we can get caught up on some questions here. Yep, yeah, Ray, there's a few questions about tearing down the building. Of course, we have to tear down the existing site and about the timeline. Okay, well, we'll talk about, you know, since we're going to be, you know, obviously demolishing this building, um, you know, our plan during the demolition and the construction of this new building would be to look for an alternative location on Key Biscayne. Um, that potentially might involve the village of Key Biscayne if they're able to find a suitable space, you know, somewhere, I don't know where, but we'll see. And if that doesn't work out, you know, we would likely want to rent a storefront during a store, at least storefront location during the construction period to make sure that there's still a service point available on key on the key to scan during construction. And timeline. So it, it's always difficult to guess that. Um, as I mentioned early on in the meeting, you know, we really would like to get beyond conceptual design and into design criteria development. You know, design criteria development would probably take around four months. Um, during that time period, we would also be developing the request for proposals that we would have to advertise, uh, conduct selection committee, select a contractor, award. So, I mean, I think best case scenario, if everything goes perfectly, you know, perhaps sometime in 20, 2023, we could be begin construction. Uh, I don't want to be held to that because, you know, who knows, um, but that is kind of what we're looking at right now. And we'll see how this uh, conceptual process progresses. And hopefully we can move on to the next stage of development. But I would really like to get a request for proposals on the street sometime next year. 
All right, let me check the questions again. Uh, I think Lydia, you mentioned someone had their hand raised as opposed to a question. All right, I see, uh, I'm just gonna go by the order in which I see him. Michael Polakov. Yes, can you hear me please? Yes, sir. Okay, good evening. Uh, I had the great pleasure to be at your uh, your first presentation. In fact, I came to the Lighthouse Room this night with a whole bunch of uh, people to, to hear it in person, but we're doing it virtually. So let me first mention, I'm a resident of Key Colony, a resident of Key Biscayne for over 35 years. And I must say that the new plan compared to the original is impressive. And to Emilio and your team, your talent is obviously absolutely immense. Nevertheless, I have some concerns and I have been in building and development design for my entire career. So please let me share those concerns. They are not meant as a criticism, but they are of question in nature. The original presentation was that this would be on the same footprint. That's entirely impossible. I, I, I can't believe that that wasn't clarified for those people who are not familiar with footprint. But my problem is that because of the fact that the setbacks are now seemingly even more minimal than before, especially on the Senesta and Crandon corner side, without the ability to corbel, possibly into what was that original outdoor seating area, the building erupts like a pro close to 40 foot behemoth from the corner of Crandon and Senesta barely 10 feet in from the sidewalk at the corner and maybe 15 feet on the Senesta side. And for those people who aren't in development and don't read plans, we're talking about a close to 40 foot building literally popping out of the sidewalk just a few feet from the sidewalk itself. So I'd like us to consider what can be done with a little bit of change to setbacks there. Next on the Senesta side, we spoke about a true drop off zone for children as well as seniors. But this now has turned into something that wouldn't even qualify as a jack-in-the-box drive-by window for get about drop-off window for people. And there will be problems with people coming down Senesta Drive and trying to turn around without there being some consideration to a roundabout to let cars coming down be able to get out and use any aspect of the drop-off. I, I hope that makes some sense. And I'm just running through these questions and then you answer as you desire. Regarding the question of height, if we're looking at 40 feet, that's more for four stories than for two stories. And my concern is at the intersection that I just described, the Senesta and Crandon, this is so immense, but from the Emerald Bay Key Colony side, I'd like to ask you please to calculate without distortion, what the additional number of feet will be over the current library roof line. And also in your rendering that you showed, it looked like that building was set back 100 feet or at least 50 to 70 feet from our driveway. And I would ask that you please give us an accurate dimension of how far from that driveway or from the fence line the building is actually going to be. As a very last point, again, I hope you'll find all of these as sensitive rather than critical. The landscaping on that piece of land is a 45 year old treasure. It is absolutely wonderful and beautiful. The chopping down of it would change the entire complexion of that part of Key Biscayne, not just this plot of land. And I'm very concerned that the site plan doesn't do anything to ensconce and or benefit from the immense amount of landscaping that is what people will see when they are coming on Crandon Boulevard in the direction of Harbor Drive. So I hope my points here can, can be addressed. They are said with great respect to what you've designed, but also with respect to those of us who live here. Thank you, Mr. Polka. Very, very good comments. I really appreciate that. I, I don't know that we can answer all of that right now, but there are things that we will, uh, We'll have to get back on. I hope you understand that. I do. And appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, uh, Katie Petros. Hi there. I didn't know that I had my hand raised, but um, thank you for letting me speak. And I reiterate a lot of what the, the previous 
caller was talking about, which is I, I very much like the changes that you have made from May until now. And I think the building does have a bit of a lighter look to it, which is nice. Uh, I was very interested to hear about the, the background of the, the undulating um, vertical and horizontal components and that they're likened to a mangrove root. I thought that was interesting. I do have a little bit of concern of whether or not that will effectively provide shade because they are open slats. And I would be interested in knowing if there's a building that we could see in finished form that would help us understand how that works. Uh, I also like the idea of making sure that we maximize the setbacks we can while getting a functional building, but I would, I would err on the side of beauty over space because I think we've had a very small library and uh, we're gonna end up with significantly more space. So maybe we can be more efficient on the inside and, and narrow it slightly. One of the things that I had been considering as well, and Ray, I think I emailed you this, but this idea of potentially having some type of access for golf carts on the off the Senesta Drive so that we could minimize any increase in traffic to the actual parking lot. Um, but I, I'm overall very grateful that you're bringing this to us. It's a thoughtful plan and I appreciate that you're open to hearing all of our comments as we move forward. The last thing I would ask is maybe the architects could give us some idea of materials that they're considering for the building because as it appears now, it's a white, it's just white and that could make a big difference in the, the overall look of the building at the end. So that's it for now, but thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, so I don't know, Emilio or Natty, we had some, some really good thoughts and questions from those first two that had their hand raised. Uh, do you want to address any of that right now, or do you want to come back to it? Well, I mean, uh, we, could, we could address a couple. One that Michael brought up, it was uh, the footprint. Uh, I mean, there, there's really no way to, to provide all that increased square footage and, and, and still keep it within the, the footprint of the building. Um, some of the, a lot of the, the biggest portion of, of what's driving the setbacks is the, the program inside, we're just kind of pushing out from the existing, uh, footprint of the library, just kind of expanding out as the, as the square footage grows. Um, but we are, we are trying our best to remain respectful to the, to the existing landscape. That is that is a big uh, driving point for sure. Um, and a, another thing, I guess. Uh, and, for, and for, for the, yes, Emilio, and the east, uh, the 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 location of the east line of the building has not shifted beyond what's existing, correct? It has not. No. Correct. So it's in, it, it there. It's no closer to the east property line than the existing building. Correct. And I mean, uh, uh, also Michael mentioned that it looked like the the building was set back about a hundred feet away from 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 the key colony condo. I mean, it, it might just be the perspective of the rendering. I guess we could, in, in a future presentation, provide some dimensioned uh, site plan drawings as as we go developing it. But I mean, it, it's 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 been modeled true to 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 what, what the information that we have available. We're not trying to fudge anything uh, in, 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 in that sense. Um, and let me see, uh, another thing was the access on Sonesta Drive. We were not envisioning that as a senior or student drop-off. That was more a library operational type of thing. Uh, that, that is something that, that we discuss with with the library department to see if 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 we would incorporate that that portion thank you emilio i'm going to go to judd curlin cheek mr curlin cheek if you can unmute yourself I'm sorry. Thank you for providing us an opportunity to comment. I appreciate it. I think your architects have done a 
an outstanding job with the basic design of the building and attempting to integrate it into the property. However, I've got a couple of comments. On one, I'm also concerned about the line of sight from Sinesta across the building and into Cranon Boulevard. Two, you're going to have children being dropped off. It's going to, that's going to happen. And that's going to happen on Cranon Boulevard. And that's going to jam up uh, traffic. So I think you need to address that on the Sinesta side. And in a presentation, one of the staff members mentioned a garage. I'm not sure, do you, are, is there going to be an under, an under building garage? No, we did not have plans for a garage. Okay, that's good. And you're measuring height from the finished slab or from the uh, sidewalk? I mean, uh, the, the, the current uh, sidewalk set, uh, is set at uh, five uh, feet and GVD. Uh, so this building is going up an additional five feet uh, to the first level. And then to the very top of the, the main, uh, let's say roof slab, you're at, at 35 feet from the sidewalk. And then at the Northwest corner, it's that it pops up an additional two feet uh, where the signage, where the signage is on uh, Crandon Boulevard. Yeah, more there, there where Ray has his, his pointer. And that it's two additional feet from the 35. So we're at 37 feet uh, from the, the current sidewalk elevation. Okay, because I heard in the presentation you were at 40 feet. And I understand the height because you want to have a vaulted ceiling. A um, couple other comments. You didn't mention anything about a green building on this. And I'm concerned about the roof. The roof is going to be viewed by everybody on the, uh, that side of Key Colony. It's a flat, a white roof or appears to be white. There is a lot of landscaping that will be above the roof line, meaning from the trees. And that white roof is going to turn dirty over time. And I, one other comment, I'm, I'm not quite sure, but um, the Village's Civic Center was designed in a mode called Key West Vernacular. We like to call it Key, call, key Biscayne Vernacular with uh, windows and CBS building. And the, obviously that's, that's the Civic Center. But however, we have taken that design even to the bus stops, uh, bus shelters with, with metal seam roof. Um, if you would comment about that and why you picked this particular design as opposed to the municipal design that we have for all of our municipal buildings, including the, like I say, the bus shelters, the fire station, the police, the village hall, community center, and in, and in the beach park. And then I think the last comment I have was the, we had always, as far as size, I, I'm a former building zoning planning director with the village. We had always looked at 20,000 square feet, thereabouts. So I, I'm glad to see that you you kept that number in there. And then and I, and the, uh, the last comment would be the front door, or I, next to the last comment. If you can switch to the elevation showing the front would be your west elevation. Yeah, without the trees. Yeah, you're, okay, this is better. I, I was concerned that the steps didn't really connote a sense of entry. And I am still a little bit concerned about that. The way the windows are, the front doors don't really signal an entry. The steps to some extent do. So I wish you could sit, if you wanna make that entry fine, <clears throat> a little bit larger. You were very concerned about signage here on the key. You've got two signs for the building. One on the lower right-hand corner, one in the upper left-hand corner. Village Hall has one sign, and Village Hall is almost 40,000 square feet. And uh, it's in the lower right-hand corner, so I would ask you to remove the sign in the upper left-hand corner. It's not necessary. I mean, the, the building will be known as the library, because everybody on the key is going to know it's a library. and almost doesn't require a sign, but nevertheless, I would ask that you have one sign. And can you address how, the, uh, how you're meeting the ADA requirements? Sure. That, that one we could uh, address. Uh, Ray, if you switch to the, the floor plan, we could show. Yeah, and just to address one or two quick little, or one thing at least, this will be a minimum lead, lead silver building. Um, that is a county requirement. Uh, so that just to answer one of those questions on this being a green building, 
And of course, we always try to exceed that and get gold or even better if we can. Um, and as I mentioned at the onset, you know, colors and finishes have not been you know, selected yet. And even though the roof is showing as white now, I mean, perhaps one of the lead elements of this could be solar panels. So uh, if they're if we're able to you know, have solar panels on the roof, you know, that may be a different look to it. So that's something that we need to talk about a little bit more, um, but just want to address those two quick things. Emilio, is that the slide that you wanted? Yeah, yeah, that, that were, I mean, solar panels or, or a, a, a living roof, a green roof, it's also a possibility to comply with, with LEED. Uh, so, so the ADA axis is, uh, would be on, on the top left-hand corner of the building. You see, well, there, where Ray has his, his pointer, that would be the, the, the access point. And then you, it would be a, a gradual uh, climb from the Crandon Boulevard side on, that, on the north, uh, northwest corner up to that top point where it ends up meeting up with the, with the entrance from the parking lot. You, you may want to, I'm not quite sure on the ADA regulations, but I think the, you have to be closer to the front door than the side door, but nevertheless also, and then lastly, I'll let somebody else talk. This property is zone GU, government use. And uh, I'm not quite sure how, the, whether the county has to comply with our own GU regulations but I think that there's a height limit of 35 feet. You may want to check into that. And whether um, the actual site plan public hearing is required by the village council pursuant to our zoning code. Um, it, so just I, to answer that really quickly, uh, we are going to be going, through, we, we are required to comply with all of the village requirements to, and they will be handling the permit process for this building. Um, so, and we very much want to make sure that we're in compliance with everything that's required on Key Biscayne. And we've been meeting with uh, the village manager and his team to get some input on you know, a few of the things that you've even brought up already. And we'll, consider, we'll continue to have that dialogue as we go forward. All right, again, thank you. I, I think you, you're all done a terrific job with this building. It's, it's very impressive. And it's going to be a, a fine addition to the village. And we've all, there are many of us in the village who have worked over 20 years to get a brand new library. So we are very grateful that this is now proceeding. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I'm going to go to Mr. Camejo, Antonio Camejo. Hi, good evening. Um, I wanna you know, thank you for um, the work you've done. Uh, um, for uh, Commissioner Raquel Regalado for, for having um, uh, move this forward along with uh, Ray Baker and, and uh, to, uh, to the point where we will have a new library. Uh, there, there are still some remaining uh, concerns. I think this is a, a big improvement from the previous um, uh, presentation that was done. Uh, I did notice uh, two, two uh, elements that I have questions about. One is uh, it's showing a mechanical room on the north um, east side of the building on the, on the first floor. And my understanding was that all of this was gonna be moved west. So it was away from the residential part of the building. Um, and also on the second level, uh, there is a balcony and the balcony is open. It looks like it's open if I'm not mistaken, uh, unless it, that's a wall on the, on the uh, uh, east, uh, northeast side. So that the view is over over the pond and over the the, uh, the vegetation, perhaps. Uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, that that area over by uh, to the to the right of the picture literally is looking uh, on top of uh, the lanais of the uh, of the Emerald Bay. Uh, and if something could be done there to provide a, a more of a privacy screen and orient the look. Over you know over the vegetation over the pond, which is is really the the beautiful way to do it. And I'm uh, these slats are very interesting, but it's going to block the view downward into into the uh, uh, into the um, the grove there of, uh, of vegetation, which is beautiful. the the other The other concern is um, in terms of the size, the volume of the 
of the space. And, and uh, you know, I get that 20,000 square feet is, is the program. Um, perhaps that could be tweaked some, uh, somewhat to, uh, uh, to provide um, um, a, less of a rectangular box shape to the, uh, to the building. But uh, there's been a lot of very good elements incorporated and uh, really appreciative of that. Uh, and again, on the really appreciate the fact that for Key Colony, you have moved some of the very noisy um, metal um, garbage uh, cans, and hopefully they can be turned to, to uh, plastic instead of metal uh, steel, and and move those things away from the residential um, uh, area of the building. And that that that's uh, very very much appreciated. Uh, it would be interesting to see. Um, uh, at a later stage, the vegetation that is going to be recommended because that needs to be uh, in, in improved for the uh, for the privacy um, the privacy element. And I, I'm not going to get into programming. I, I raised some questions of uh, some ideas that uh, hopefully that you you know you could consider. But one of the things that's been raised uh, by a number of um, uh, parents. Uh, is uh, having soundproof music rooms incorporated into the into the program? There is no place on the island for uh, kids to learn a musical instrument like a trumpet or drums uh, or any musical instrument, uh, really. Uh, it, especially in the condos, it's uh, it's a, almost impossible to do that. And uh, adding that element would be um, uh, a soundproof uh, room where a, an individual student can go in and practice a musical instrument would be, uh, would be really great. Hey, Tony, that, that solution for music is on the screen. Um, our U Media Miami locations, which we would plan to have inside this library, are you know, very much about bringing not only 21st century technology, but you see kids there playing instruments. There's a sound recording room. Um, this is all instructor, mentor-led areas. You know, mostly focused on teens, but also available to people of all ages. Um, so we do think that not only this space, which will be part of this branch, but also some of the other community room type spaces that we have set aside inside the layout will offer opportunities for, you know, just about any type of classes you want to have. That's, that's great. And it's going to be, they're going to be soundproofed uh, uh, rooms so that the the, uh, especially the electronic, uh, any electronic music or even uh, acoustic instruments don't travel out uh, to, to the adjoining neighborhood. But we'll, we'll make sure that doesn't happen. How's that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I know I'm way behind on questions, but we are going to get through them all. And let's see. No question there. At some point, when most of the books will be stored. And also, what type of circulation do you expect that our library would expand from our current collection? So, someone is asking about as uh, that was Katie Petros asking about the collection. So, look, this is you know going to be a much larger branch than we have now, and you know it will have a larger collection, um, and. You know, the great thing about being part of a large library system is that, you know, any book in the entire system is available, um, even if it's not in the branch that you are going to. Um, we have a great logistics system that gets uh, a book from North Day to Key Biscayne, usually within about two days. But you do see some of the shelving that we're, you know, anticipating here. This is on the first floor. Uh, we were looking at giving it kind of a unique design with some low shelving in that area. And of course, the children's room will have book shelving. And then, um, you know, it will be throughout the branch. And as much as we need to get the collection, we, have, we haven't really determined the exact collection size yet. And, you know, frankly, that is important, but it will be something that we you know, back into based on the usage, um, based on what we've seen in terms of checkout in the past and also adjusting for the fact that we're gonna have a much larger branch um, than we currently do. So it will be a larger collection. Hope I answered that question. 
does the printing include the ability for 3D printing? So once again, in our U Media space, they almost always have a 3D printer. Um, and I expect we will have 3D printing available in here as well. It's kind of a common device that we make available. And uh, we, one of the great things about U Media is, as I said, it's mentor led. And usually the people that are working in that space will guide people on how to use a 3D printer. So it's really a big part of our you know, STEAM and STEM education that we do a lot of in our libraries now. <clears throat> so I hope I answered that question. Uh, someone asked, will you keep the pond in front where turtles and birds flock? Yes, the pond is planned to stay right where it is and hopefully the turtles and the birds too. Emilio, this one I can't answer. Are there any completed buildings in the county that we could see where they have created the facade depicted in this concept? In parentheses, the mangrove feature. I mean, I, I guess the, the closest I can imagine, uh, I can I point you to would be the brand new renovated Miami Beach Convention Center has a similar feature that it, it, it doubles as a fin over glass uh, concept. So the Miami Beach Convention Center is what, what I would say. Thank you. And someone asked if we could show the renderings towards Sinesta Drive. I think this is the only rendering I have of, I don't have a better angle. So before the next presentation that we do, or next time we send out these renderings, we'll be sure to include a better shot of that side. So thank you for the question. Uh, Ceci Sanchez, Crandon Boulevard Terrace facing west will be extremely hot, especially in summer. Can this feature face the pond instead? So um, I think Natty addressed a little bit the issue of that the glass we use will you know, help a lot with radiant heat on that side. And I'm sure that we'll have shades as well. So, but certainly as we come out with all the comments that come out of this meeting, you know, we'll certainly talk about that Western exposure some more. Um, like I mentioned, uh, I've heard that comment from a few different people now. So we'll certainly take a closer look at it and discuss it. So thank you. Uh, nice compliment on the design. So thank you. Oh, someone did ask about the opening that we created between the first and second floor on the inside. Let me see if I can get to that rendering and how that will affect noise. So I, I'm not terribly concerned about it because most of the rooms on the second floor are all enclosed rooms. So it's not like uh, you know, both the first and the second floor are wide open spaces where sound's gonna carry through there. And even on the first floor, you, know, you see that there's other enclosed spaces like the children's room and the sitting area that's on the pond side here. So we're not terribly concerned about that, but it's a good question. Yeah, I mean, uh, bo both of the areas that are connected are supposed to be uh, quiet reading areas reflective reading areas and every everything on the on the noisier side or where you can actually speak to each other are enclosed as ray mentioned on on both floors the community rooms the children's reading rooms the group study rooms toward toward the east also are all enclosed thank you uh, patricia augustini asked where can we get a copy of this presentation uh, let me see, hold on one second here. Oh, that link isn't there. Uh, there is a link that I think Lydia is gonna post. Oh, she did, Lydia Lopez posted in there. You can find a copy of the presentation at the link shown there. And if you prefer a full slide deck of it, you can email us at this feedback at mdpls.org email address and we'll send you um, a PDF version of it. And Louisa Conway is asking, could you please advise if a traffic plan has been devised? 
The key colony Cramden intersection is the busiest, and I'm interested to learn how traffic to and from the library on Cramden will be planned. Uh, Louisa, that's a great question, and good evening, by the way. And that is something that we will certainly be required to do as we go through the permitting process and the design process. Actually, we'll you know, probably need to do that through the design process to really get into the permitting process with the village. I don't know, Steve, do you want to comment on that at all? Thanks for unmuting me there, uh, Ray. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Louise, this is this is obviously very important to us. And uh, we're looking at, in fact, we just did a notice to proceed on relooking the redesign for Cranon Boulevard. And we've talked with Ray's staff before. We're going to make sure that this design integrates with what we're doing and to make sure that we're very aware of that intersection and make sure that we address the problems it's facing right there. Oops. Thank you, Steve. Okay, I think I caught up in chat. Now I'm gonna go into the question and the answers that were, there's a, two sets of questions and answers. Uh, we talked to Mr. Curlin Cheek already. Uh, we talked a little bit about the project schedule, which, you know, there's still obviously quite a bit of work to be done on the conceptual design and to get to the design criteria. But as I mentioned, we would really like to be able to get a request for proposals advertised sometime in 2022. And then we would see how long that takes to get to a point to where we're ready to select a contractor um, and you know, issue a notice to proceed. So we'll have, we'll have a better idea soon, I think, on a better timeline. Uh, someone is asking, can we have two elevators? It says anonymous attendee. Can we have two elevators? One has always been sufficient at the community center. I assume they meant to say one has always been insufficient at the community center. But we'll take a look at that. I don't know that we'd have space for a second elevator, but certainly as we look at all these comments, we'll, we'll talk through that. Oh, then I see the follow-up question. One has never been sufficient, so thank you. Will the nice tables for picnic lunches still be available? Uh, we plan to you know, enhance that area around the pond. Um, I don't know if we want to keep the exact same tables or get something nicer. Uh, we really haven't talked too much about the furniture around the pond yet, but believe me, we want that to be a nicer area even than it is now when this building is done and even a more functional area with hopefully much better furniture. Is it a long walk from the car park for seniors? An easy drop-off point for seniors and date disabled from cars is essential. Uh, so the current parking lot would likely be in the same location. Um, and I know we've heard some comments here about a drop-off the possibility of a drop-off point somewhere. So we'll certainly take a look at that. I don't know if Emilio or Natty, do you have any comments on any of the things that I'm, that I'm getting as we go? I mean, so far you're, you're right on the mark. I mean, a drop-off would be a wonderful thing. Uh, but again, it, it needs to some cooperation with the, uh, with Key Biscayne and that remod renovation of the, of the, Random Boulevard. All right. What type? What type of access is that Sinesta Drive? Uh, I think that goes to uh, Mr. Polakov's questions earlier, which is something that we're going to have to take a take a look at. Uh, how big are the meeting rooms? You are going to test my vision tonight. Let me get back to that slide. Do I remember? So on the second floor, we have uh, one 876 square foot meeting room, another one that's about 876. The tutoring room and multi-purpose room is about 1500. And this other room, I can't read that number on there, so forgive me, but it looks like it's about the same size as the 876 square feet. Rooms. So the community room and lounge is the 1115, 1115 square feet on the bottom left hand side there. Thank you, Emilio. 
let me know which other one you can't see the the u media are split uh 876 <clears throat> uh, square feet each each of the two building uh each of the two rooms um connected by a door you mentioned the community room on the southeast portion. That's 930 square feet. And the tutoring, 1,550. See, if you want to switch to the ground level, I could also help you out. OK. okay. On, on the ground level, on the uh, Crandon Boulevard facing the pond, the, the community room is 1,645, 43 square feet. Uh, the children's uh, room is uh, 25, 2,515. And the main reading room, we have it at uh, 4,560 square feet. Thank you. And Tony Camejo posted, why not consider respecting the natural landscape and reduce the interior volume? And you know, once again, we, we've heard some comments on you know, we heard the enormity of the building and the setbacks. So you know, look, we're not pegged on 20,000 square feet or, or nothing. Um, look, let's, we'll take another look at that. But however, you don't want to give up uh, the new functions that you know, are really going to serve the community. Absolutely. And Mr. or Ms. Vinson, pardon me, and that says Jay Spenson. How many parking spaces do we have? And that will be also part of the working with the village of Key Biscayne to you know, figure out our square footage and meeting the parking requirement and how we're going to accomplish that. So you know, we know how many are there now, but you know, how many are required for the new building will be something that we need to work through. And I think I am caught up with raised, oh, Seresta Roland, I'm going to open up the mic for you. Thank you for your patience. Seresta. Um, if you can unmute yourself. Okay, you can hear me now? Yes. Okay, um, I'm a librarian. I was a librarian for 12 years at Key Biscayne Library. And I'm wondering if any of you are librarians or have, have ever worked in a library. I worked as a librarian when I was in, in uh, middle school. That's a long okay, time. Well, that's what I thought. First of all, <laughs> how many books do you think you can house here? I believe Key Biscayne, last I recall, we had 50,000 volumes. I don't see room for... I don't know, 10,000 volumes in, in the shelving that you're showing. Okay. Ralph, do you want to talk about the collection at all? So Ralph Costa is our assistant director for library services. He has about 25 years, maybe even more, working for Miami-Dade Public Library. You may even know each other. Yes, I've worked for the library system, Ralph Costa, for 26 years. Um, I have worked with the branch manager. The collection that you're looking at right there on, on these plans are about 20% more than what the current building has. So um, the shelving that you see um, and the size of, uh, of the collection was worked closely with the branch staff that is there now. So the the circular thing, that's for adult books? The, There's the, adult books in that area. The community okay. room um, at the bottom also has shelving and additional shelving uh, for books and additional magazines and periodicals, uh, which will expand that collection as well. Um, and definitely the children's room being 2,500 square feet. Uh, all that you see in the perimeter is shelving. And then the stacks there in the center are additional shelves as well. I see. So all the way around the perimeter, that's for shelving. Because yeah, I need, I see a lot of tables and chairs, and I see some other uh, sections that look like shelving at the top part. But um, but and then there's a semicircular uh, thing, but also Correct. around the perimeter. Okay. Correct. The, the perimeter is all shelving, and the semicircle incorporates shelving and seating. Uh, the blocks that you see at the higher area of the children's section, those are all shelves. 
Um, and what we've done with the design of new buildings is we increased the perimeter shelving so that the furniture can also be moved. So if we need to expand and create a larger children's area for programming, all that area in the center, including the shelving on casters, move. Okay, and the other thing is this gentleman uh, mentioned something about having music here. I mean, it seems to me that that's something that would be more appropriate for the community center. I mean, you want the library to be fairly quiet and that with the soundproofing, um, I don't know how quiet it's going to be. Um, you know, that, that's a concern I would have having, having um, music going on, um, you know, in, a, in, a, in the building versus um, it seems the community center would be a far better place for that to happen. Personally, um, we have incorporated U Media spaces in most of our regional locations, um, and basically, you know, there's quiet areas as, as they as they've explained in the uh, presentation. Um, your quiet areas would be there, but the U Media locations with music and activities for young adults um, exist in many of our current locations and. It works perfectly. Um, so it's it's a space and a building for all. Okay, because someone was talking about drummers and I mean trumpeters and whatever. It just seems like it would be really hard. You know, the door opens and and you know it may be soundproof, but the door opens every time the door opens. That sound's going to be coming out. So. Well, I mean, also we we worked on on other library designs and how the the U Media that that component has been handled is a soundproof uh, booth, which allows for practice and recording. And it and that is within already an enclosed room. So I mean, if, if you open the soundproof booth and the, the person keeps playing, there's still that other secondary boundary of, of the U Media enclosure around it. Correct. Okay. And I think thank it's you. Thank you, Ms. Roland. I think it's important to point out too that even if there happens to be some music classes. It's not going to be like, you know, we open the doors at 930 and then, you know, instruments are playing from 930 to 8 p.m. at night. I mean, usually these are programs that go on for maybe an hour or something like that, maybe a couple times a week. You know, we have all kinds of different, you know, activities that happen in the library and it's uh, just very common for us to do things like that in our locations now. So. But certainly we won't, weren't going to do things that make it unusable for other people in the library. Great comments though. Definitely helpful. Okay, I am not sure if I have gotten through all the questions. I think I've gotten through most everyone. And I still know I haven't gotten through the entire presentation yet. So, but I think we've talked about a lot of the things that I was going to talk about in uh, earlier and some of the features of the building, which you know, I think we've already covered and certainly you all can cover um, by going through the slides some more and asking any questions about, <clears throat> about, the, about the building and some of the spaces and programs and activities. All right, I'm being informed that Louisa has her hand raised. Where is Louisa? Okay, she changed her mind. Um, so we talked about U Media Miami, I think, quite a bit already. Uh, you know, one of the areas, and this was a really an, an initiative we worked with with Commissioner Regalado and University of Miami. Uh, Nova Southeastern. Um, a couple of months ago, Miami Dade Public Library was certified by UMNSU CARD as an autism friendly library system. And that was mostly related to kind of our interior signage and ways of assisting people who are neurodivergent. Uh, we are probably going to try to carve out a space in the children's area that is a sensory friendly room for people who, um, whether it's neurodivergent children or adults to be able to have a space to go to in the library. We have not done one of these before. Um, this would be the first. And I know we'll have a little bit more work on really figuring out exactly where we're going to put this and how we'll set it up. But 
So it is a novel concept for us. And so other things we've talked about our homework help and tutoring program in, in prior presentations. You know, we have certified teachers that provide um, in-person programming. Right now we're still doing it online because of COVID-19, but I suspect by the time a branch opens, we'll be back to in-person tutoring as well. Um, we do not only tutoring for K through 12 children, we do, we have an adult learning academy as well, where certified teachers also give GED instruction, language classes, citizenship classes, and things like that for people who are interested. And of course, we would tailor those programs to the interests of the people on Key Biscayne. Um, and there'll be, you saw on the floor plan, you know, study areas, study booths that we would have in the library for people to study and read. We talked about the multiple meeting spaces. Um, and I think it's also important to point out that, you know, we are very intentionally throughout the library system, rolling out more and more services that allow people to access the library from home. Um, for those of you who are library power users, you, you know that you can access the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. We have multiple ebook and e audiobook, audiobook platforms that you can download to an app on your phone. It's very much like uh, an Amazon Kindle account, except that you're already paying for it and you do not have to pay a monthly fee. You're prepaying it via your taxes. We are also now doing home delivery services where anyone who wants an item mailed to their home, um, they can do so. And we're also lending out technology. A couple of months ago, we started a tablet lending program where you can check out a Samsung tablet that has built-in internet services and use it at home if you don't have adequate internet at home or if you don't have internet service at home at all. So these are things I think too that you know, when people worry about you know, additional traffic and things like that, a lot of people you know, are accessing the library um, entirely from home, all the way from library card sign up to getting their books mailed to their house. And that's all I have. Emilio, Natty, any of the other panelists, would you like to add anything or comment? I don't know. The only thing from our team is that we're really excited to be involved with you guys in, in this project and with the community. And this input is very important to the process. And it really makes a difference. So I really appreciate everybody that has shown up tonight to, to have their say early on in the design process. Thank you, Natty, Emilio, Steve. Yeah, Ray, I'd like to, I'd like to really thank you and your team um, for, first of all, prior to this, obviously, coming and working with our team on, on one of the requirements and then also presenting this to the community. And, and we look forward to working with you going forward. Uh, this is a big a big project for the village. And um, we also appreciate you just laying this out to the community and hopefully we can do this again as the design process moves forward. Yes, we thank you, Steve. And thank you for all the time you've been you know, guiding us on this. We really appreciate the collaboration. And to close out, you know, once again, any additional comments that you have, feedback at mdpls.org. And I believe that the recording of this meeting will go to all of you afterwards, and especially for those who maybe signed up but weren't able to attend. Um, you should get a link to the recording so you can listen to it. We are also going to put the recording on our website. And you know, our next step is to take all of these wonderful comments and suggestions, you know, regroup with our architectural team and see where we go from here. Um, and I really do appreciate your forthrightness. And uh, I just want you all to know you're not gonna hurt my feelings with comments. I, I really like to get as much feedback as possible. Uh, it's very important to me that whether my name is on it or you know, Miami-Dade County's name is on it and it's in the village of Kivas Game that we're your service provider and we want you to have a great facility that the entire community really appreciates and is happy with. So we're gonna do our best to get there. 
And with that, I'm going to end the meeting and wish you all a good night and the happiest of holidays. Thank you very much.